Good evening. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Matthew Stewart. I am the president and founder of Stewart Speaker Series. We are delighted to have you here uh, at the Pike Performing Arts Center. And you look wonderful from this vantage point on stage. Give yourselves a round of applause. I tell you, it's been a fun, uh, but yet exciting. Um, it's been a long day because we started early this morning with each one of the uh, special guests going to either a school or participating in another venue uh, where we can impact young people. And so we have been going all day and just when we think uh, it can't get any higher. Uh, we were treated to a, we met with a group of uh, some 50 or 60 pastors earlier. And so uh, Reverend Al Sharpton started to preach. Uh, and I looked around the room and half of the pastors were up on their feet and we thought this was Sunday morning service. So we have just had a wonderful day, and I can tell you uh, that we are in for a, another treat uh, this evening. Indianapolis has done so much. Uh, we don't get the credit always from around the country, but Indianapolis is definitely on the map. It is uh, definitely a city that is on the move, and so we have to be about the business of making sure that we are at the table and that our issues are being addressed. So this evening, uh, we want to do more than just talk. Uh, it's good to come and have a conversation, but if it goes no further than that, uh, that's all it was, is just a uh, uh, walk in the park. And so we want to do more than just talk. And so those, uh, the meetings that we had earlier today are all about that. So without any further ado, if we can turn our attention to the uh, video screen. over 30 years of service to the Indianapolis community. Our mission is to present highly successful African Americans who inform, inspire, and foster insightful dialogue and cultural exchange. Whether it's a late civil rights activist, comedian Dick Gregory, or some of the top school speakers, guests have included Harry Belafonte, Dr. Benjamin Carson,
Dr. Cornell Webb. Hey, what's happening? Brother, what's up? This is a hey, how you doing? Dr. Marion Wright Edelman. Right we are the only lecture series in Indiana that offers multiple opportunities each year for community residents to engage directly in intellectually stimulating discussions, usually coupled with a formal dinner. Stewart's Speakers is more than just talk. Most people know us as the longest running speaker series in Indiana. The fact is, we provide a wide range of activities to engage with and to improve the community. Thank you very much. We just wanted to highlight a few of the speakers that we've had over the course of 32 years. So we've had some 100 plus national speakers and all the individuals you saw on the screen we've had hosted here in Indianapolis as part of Stewart Speakers. So that would not be, that would not be possible without um, the sponsorship particularly our title sponsor, IUPUI. You will be hearing from our chancellor, who uh, not only uh, extends a financial contribution, but also makes it his business, along with his wife, to attend the events and to participate in the interaction. And so we're always honored to have the two of them here and uh, available to us. So. You will also see on the back of your program other uh, sponsors, and again, without them, this evening would not uh, be possible. At this time, I'd like to bring to the podium uh, our chair of our board of directors, uh, Kimberly Bostick. Let's give her a hand. Good evening. Oh, come on. Good evening. We've got some powerhouses in the house tonight. Good evening. Good evening. There we go. Thank you so much for coming. It is a pleasure for me to be here tonight, and I am more than honored to serve as the chair for the Board of Stewart Speakers. Um, I'd first like to take the opportunity to first recognize our Board of Directors, who is a phenomenal board. Uh, we also are more than just talk because we've been working here all day. So could you just stand or raise your hand if you're a Board of Stewart Speakers and there, there are a few. Thank you so much for all that you guys do. For more than 32 years, Stewart Speakers has been changing lives in the community. Um, we, I have been blessed to be a child to grow up and listen to some of the dynamic speakers that have spoken. I've learned so much. I, I was telling later, uh, earlier today, I was talking to Miss Susan Taylor and telling her I remember her coming as a child. She came again as a, when I was a teenager and then again as a young adult. And so it's a blessing to have her here again. Um, so, so, so I'm just, I'm excited to hear the conversation. So again, thank you guys for being here. I am not going to delay and tell you about all the great things that, of my life. I'm going to let you um, get to the, the program and like to take this time to introduce um, our master of ceremony, Mr. Mark Mullins. Um, he is anchor at uh, RTV6 comes from Connecticut. You've seen him on TV. I'm not going to give a long speech. Please give a round of applause for Mr. Mark Mullins. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, good evening, everybody. Yeah, and welcome. Welcome to the 2018-2019 Stewart Speaker Series 32nd Annual Lecture Series season. 32 years we've been doing this and meeting here like this. This year's theme is the year of the woman. And so guys out there, let's put our hands together for our strong women this year. You know, this is an exciting time for the Stewart Speaker Series, celebrating 32 years of impact and charts the course for many more years of service down the line to the Indianapolis community. My name is Mark Mullins, and I'm very honored and pleased to serve as your Master of Ceremony for tonight. We're going to keep that evening going. Let me tell you about tonight's event. It's going to be a very dynamic evening. 
this event means so much to the community because it gets a discussion going that we all need to be having. It gives us a chance to ask questions that probably others of us in the audience have. It gives us a chance to share ideas and then take what we learn here today and take it back to our neighborhoods, to our blocks, to our schools, to our community to educate and to foster that dialogue to continue moving. I'm thankful to Matt and to the Steward Speakers Board of Directors who we just applauded, the leadership team for allowing me to be here tonight. We're excited to, we're excited to welcome all our prestigious panelists who have taken time out of their day and their lives to be here with us to hold this very important conversation tonight. The State of Black Affairs Indianapolis edition. That's what we're tackling tonight. So we also want to welcome you. So welcome. Thank you for being here. If this is your first visit to the Stuart Speaker Series, be aware that we encourage audience participation and input. Your input out there is essential for this series, especially for the community. This town hall, it creates for us events that are timely, relevant, lively, engaging, and informative. So again, we ask for you to please fill out those evaluation forms that you got. They were provided in your programs. Again, your feedback is extremely important here. It's valuable and we use it to shape future programs, future lectures, so we can continue beyond the 32 years. Also, we rely on you, the audience tonight, to pose relevant questions, engaging questions throughout tonight's panel discussion. So make sure now that you're gathering your thoughts in advance. Uh, make sure that when you approach the microphone, you have your coherent questions ready. I'll be roaming around with mics on the floor. There's also two floor mics that we'll invite you up to later in the program uh, in the aisles here. And if you'd like to pose a brief question for our panelists directly or you have a statement, we ask at that time that you raise your hand so we can find you, we'll call you up, uh, we can get, you, uh, get to you or assign you to one of these uh, microphones in the middle of the auditorium in a timely and orderly fashion. So one other important note, we ask that you please, please, please turn off or silence your cell phones right now. If you don't mind doing that, there's always one, always one that goes off ringing with some odd ringtone. <laughs> the Stewart Speaker Series is proud to be powered by Indiana University, Purdue University, Indianapolis, or IUPUI, and we are excited to have IUPUI back this season as our title sponsor. So let's have a round of applause and acknowledgement for our title sponsor, as well as our other 2018-2019 season sponsors. A complete list of those sponsors can be found in the back of your program. Without our many sponsors here, this season would not be possible. We also want to thank our board of directors and leadership team for organizing this series. And all of the volunteers, so many of you out there, who do that hard work behind the scenes to make this evening possible. So, thank you. We are most grateful to our season ticket holders and all of you in attendance tonight. We appreciate you being here. Your input tonight is what will ensure tonight's success. So we hope that you will continue to support the Steward Speaker Series. Without further ado, please join me in welcoming to the podium Dr. Nasser Pedar, Chancellor of IUPUI, to the stage to offer remarks tonight. Thank you very much, and good evening. We had practiced this before. You could do better than this. Good evening. good evening. Well, we are proud. IUPI is proud to be title sponsor for the Steward Speaker Series. For more than 32 years, as long as I've been at IUPI, the series has brought over 100 leaders, community advocates, and other public figures to Indianapolis to speak about the power of human potential. This would not have been happen, uh, uh, possible without Matt's uh, great work. Let's hear it again for Matt. <laughs> the state of black America is profound conversation that IUPUI is proud to be part of. But we at IUPUI have taken the initiative to go beyond conversation and implement policies and practices that reflect our commitment particularly since we all know that higher education is a critical factor in determining the state of African-American quality of life. This past fall, we welcomed one of the most talented 
and most diverse freshman classes at IUPI ever. In fact, 30% of our first year students are students of color. As great as that is, we aim to do better. We're working towards 51%. That's right. In the past three years, we have doubled need-based aid to help recruit students from every background. With our actions, including supporting this important speaker series, we have spoken. We at IUPI expressed this commitment when we announced our partnership with the Madam Walker Legacy Center Board of Directors this year. This, this groundbreaking collaboration, supported by $15 million from Lilly Endowment, will result in the complete renovation of the beautiful Walker Theater building a year and a half from now. Right. Can't wait for that. We look forward to honoring the legacy of Madam Walker and working with the Madam Walker board to ensure that this remarkable facility remains a jewel in the city of Indianapolis. And I shuffled my script here, so let's see, what page was I? <laughs> well, in conclusion, I want to extend a special word of thanks my page is somewhere over there. <laughs> if you find it, read it and tell others what I said. <laughs> I want to extend a special word of thanks to Matthew Stewart for his leadership on this, this series and to our distinguished panelists. And thank you all again for being here this evening. I look forward to the conversation. Thank you very much. Just as long as you didn't mess up my papers. <laughs> Dr. N Nasser Pedar, thank you so much for being here. What an encouraging update from IUPUI, and we hope to see that that happens in the next year. Please now welcome to the podium a special presentation. We want to welcome Robin Hughes, the president of the Indianapolis Alumni Chapter of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority, Inc., for a distinguished presentation for one of our distinguished panelists tonight. Please welcome Ms. Hughes. Good evening. Um, as he said, my name is Robin Hughes, and I'm the president of the NNF Solemnity Chapter, and I have joined with me this evening is our first vice president, Ms. Kimberly Bug. At this time, we would like to thank the Stewart Speaker Series for allowing us to make the special presentation to Susan Taylor. Our Sora, Susan Taylor, is one of the distinguished Centennial Honorary Members. She had the privilege of being in a distinguished group of women, and she epitomizes the Delta woman. Every time I look at her accomplishments, she is fulfilling our mission statement and impacting the black community. And so we are so thankful at this time to welcome her to Indianapolis on behalf of the Indianapolis Alumni Chapter. Will all of the members of Delta Sigma Theta please stand? Thanks, oh, members. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Sir Taylor. We are so honored to have you as a member of our illustrious sisterhood. And at this time, we would just like to present with you with a small token to let you know that we appreciate you, we love you, and we will continue to keep you in our prayers. I shouldn't open it, right? Sure. 
shirt? Mm -hmm. Uh oh. <laughs> Black and gold. Ooh. <laughs> Is that fun? Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. You're welcome. She's going to look good in that, isn't she? Yes, she will. So we'll be hearing more from Ms. Taylor a little bit later in the evening, but let's get set for tonight's discussion here. Stewart Speaker Series, the State of Black Affairs panel, it's more than just talk. This panel is designed to engage national and community experts around the state of black affairs. Our distinguished moderator will engage our panelists around an identification of major issues plaguing the African American community. But more importantly, we'll use the forum as a medium to generate solutions tonight, strategies and tools to equip you to be able to make an impact around these four focus areas that we'll be talking about. As we get to those, please welcome the Vice Chair of the Board for the Seward Speaker Series, Tracy Boyd. Well, good evening again, and I'm honored to be able to serve in the capacity of uh, Board Vice Chair. Because Stuart Speakers is more than just talk, tonight we have three representatives here, and we're very passionate, like he already mentioned, about education, faith, leadership, role in the community, police community, relationships, and civic participation. So we hope that you'll be inspired and motivated to get involved, join these organizations or others, and we are ready to get started. We'll welcome, welcome Ashley. Good evening. All right, we've practiced twice now. Ready? Good evening. There we go. On behalf of our wonderful senior pastor, Pastor Jeffrey A. Johnson Sr. of Eastern Star Church, whoop, whoop. we would love to provide a great thank you to the wonderful leadership of Stuart Speakers, IEPUI, and our prestigious elected officials and speakers today. So you're probably wondering, what is Eastern Star up to today? We're doing a lot. So what we're doing specifically is taking a new lens as far as how we renew our community for the kingdom. Rock, which is, again, the acronym for renewing our community for the kingdom, is allowing our means of community development by making sure we are providing equitable, inclusive community development in some of our most underrepresented communities. We see all across central Indiana, new skyscrapers, breweries, dog parks. But what about the broken windows? What about the means of communities where abandoned housing are plaguing some of our communities, such as 46218, where 70% of the population is African American? That community alone has the same means of getting the same support of development as well. So through the ROC initiative, we're focused on four goal areas. The first one in particular is Bring in a sense of community amongst the people who live, work, really anyone who interacts with the neighborhood. So we started a neighborhood association to help assure the development we're doing is capturing the true voice and the needs of the neighbors. The second area is enhancing the range of housing options within a mile radius of our main campus. That alone, we've been blessed to say within a year and a half, we've completed 10 homes, all of which are home ownership based. Thank you. Outside of the housing that we're doing, we've been blessed to say a new 36,000 square foot facility now is in 46218. That means the first floor has commercial options where a bank, the second bank, and all of the zip code is now there to combat predatory loans. A fresh food market which is set to take away the federal standards of a fed food desert classification. And lastly, uh, direct access to a rock community hub, which is helping with housing, legal, 
workforce, life skill advancement, a barber, beautician, and more. So if you are interested in learning more about what we're doing from a financial stability lens, and again, bring in a sense of hope to the hopeless, um, and really just helping provide new opportunities, please visit www.escrockinitiative.org, and we would love to have your participation. Thanks. Good evening. I'm Pastor Wayne Moore, President of the Baptist Ministers Alliance, Pastor of the Olivet Baptist Church. I'm here to make a brief announcement tonight to get the community to catch on and be a part of what we're trying to do in the collaboration with many uh, groups uh, in our city. We're now in the process of planning and having the Indy ceasefire, which has three dimensions to it. It will start on November 2nd through the 4th. The first dimension will be uh, employment and resource fair that will be at the MLK Center from 10 to 1. And on Saturday, uh, November the 3rd, there's going to be a gun buyback program. We want to uh, do some preventative action as it relates to our homicides in our city. And we think if we can get out in front of some things, we might be able to uh, stop and decrease the level of homicides in our city. And on that particular Sunday on November 4th, we're asking all pastors who will participate in Nonviolence Sunday and give a unified message in our pulpits about nonviolence in our community. We want everybody to be a part of this. We want you to pass the word. Starting next week, you will hear everything you need to hear about this Indy ceasefire and gun buyback program, wraparound services, jobs, and et cetera, to help young men and women in our community to prevent these homicides from going on. Thank you. Good evening. It is a, it's a blessing to be here. Uh, my name is Anthony Murdoch II. I am a first year law student at the Indiana University McKinney School of Law. I am the co-creator. Uh, thank you, appreciate it. I want to respect my time. Uh, I'm also the co-creator for Power Moves Only, the co-founder of Bust the Bubble, and I humbly serve as the social action chair for the Indiana District of Alpha Alpha Fraternity Incorporated. Um, before I offer my short remarks, I want to give thanks to God for blessing me with this breath in my body. I pray that with this breath, I speak a word upon this platform that the Steward Speaker Series has so graciously granted to me that mobilizes you and your neighbor to collaborate with me and my peers as we strive towards building black. That being said, support those who are doing the work. There is no need to recreate the wheel when we can focus our energy on supporting the wheels that are already rolling. Two black-owned and black-led entities that have created self-sustaining vehicles for progress are Power Moves Only and Bust the Bubble. Power Moves Only is a brand that promotes lifestyles centered around success-oriented actions. They focus on presenting diversified images of success in hopes that it inspires people to create more personal, inclusive, and purpose-driven ideas of success. Bust the Bubble is a student movement that promotes the perspectives of students of color at predominantly white institutions through diversity education, cultural awareness, and action-oriented activism. Founded at Butler University by four black first years um, almost four years ago, it has grown into a, a force of true social change within this city, now led by four valiant, dynamic, and intelligent black women who relentlessly advocate for the voices and identities of students of color on Butler's campus and beyond. <laughs> Power Moves Only and Bust the Bubble are doing the work. The Steward Speaker Series prides itself on being more than just talk, so let's act. Both of these entities are led by the future of this city. Young, black agents of change with purpose, passion, and plans of action. Don't just stop by their table once this event is over and say hello. Engage with them so you can understand their vision. Exchange with them so you can become a part of their purpose and invest in them so we can grow together. Thank you.
Again, a reminder, we're going to be out on the table in that hallway, so please make sure you come in and see Bust the Bubble and Power Moves only after. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening. I bring greetings on behalf of the Indiana Commission on Social Status for Black Males. We had a wonderful conference. We kicked off with Dr. Eric Dyson, and uh, we appreciate all, all those who attended the conference. Let me hear you. That's right. Thank you, Matthew Stewart, for allowing us to uh, share some data. Uh, you're going to be one of the few people in America that knows this data. And uh, we presented it earlier, but he had asked us to share it with you. So black America, be prepared to uh, be enlightened a little bit. Uh, repeat after me, B arrest matter. Arrest matter. We often point our attention to incarceration, but we really need to focus on the impact of arrest. When we look at young people and we think about how many are incarcerated from the age 16 to about 19, we're looking at about 100,000 in and out throughout the year. If we look at how many young people are arrested, that's about 2.5 million. Research shows that about half of all African Americans will interact with the, particularly males, will interact with the law enforcement agency in, the, in, the, uh, uh, in terms of arrest before the age of 24, right? Now what does that do? Arrest generates a, a record. 70 million people in America have an arrest record, not a conviction, let's be clear. How many people is that? Let me put it in context. That's more people than ha that have college, bachelor's degrees. So the talent that we need to fuel this economy, we can no longer exclude people with uh, records. Records, research shows either up to a third to half of all criminal records are uh, inaccurate. I don't know about you, but that's a shouting moment. That's, that's this silent epidemic that's plaguing particularly African-American males needs to be addressed. We're disproportionately represented in the criminal and juvenile justice system. Uh, in every state, we're disproportionately represented. Research shows that the reason why is arrest. We're two, and a half, we're two times more likely as young people to be arrested. If you're arrested, you're two times more likely to be uh, uh, drop out of high school. If you appear in front of a judge, you're four times more likely to drop out of high school. For black males, if you drop out of high school, you're more likely to be in jail today, right now, than to be working. 37% of African American males who are drop out of high school are in jail or state prison or federal prison, as opposed to 26% who are working. I'm only suggesting that we look at the issue. If we understand, we, we did a, a poll, how many people were arrested? The whole room rose. I am one of those who've been arrested. We need to look at arrests and provide support services around those who interact with the law enforcement agencies in this country. Wake up, black America. And because Stuart Speakers is more than just talk, we'll continue to bring you these inspiring informational moments throughout the series. Thank you. Now, I have the distinct pleasure of introducing tonight's moderator, over the course of a journalistic career that has seen him interview multiple U.S. presidents to top athletes and entertainers in Hollywood, Roland S. Martin is a journalist who has always maintained a clear sense of his calling in this world. Martin is host and managing editor of Roland Martin Unfiltered, the first daily online show in history focused on news and analysis of politics, entertainment, sports, and culture from an explicitly African-American perspective. He has been named four times by Ebony Magazine as one of the 150 most influential African-Americans in the United States. 
In his career, Martin has been showed with more than 30 awards for journalistic excellence, including being named the Journalist of the Year in 2013 by the National Association of Black Journalists for his extensive focus on voter suppression and other issues of concern to African Americans during the 2012 election. Please give a warm Indianapolis welcome to Roland Martin. Good to see you. Appreciate it. Yeah, no problem. How y'all doing? I, I know somebody black in here asking me, did he walk out here with some orange shoes on? <laughs> y'all gotta understand, my, uh, the world champion Houston Astros are in the American League Championship. Uh, excuse me, I'm sorry y'all one in five. <laughs> oh, too soon? <laughs> Being from Houston? So, of course, I'm a Houston native, and our colors are blue and orange, so that's why I had to hit y'all with the Astro socks, too. <laughs> oh, yes, that's right. I'm coordinated. <laughs> I represent my hometown. So, Boston Red Sox, we're going to beat y'all down, just letting y'all know. Just letting y'all know. Glad to see all of you here. Uh, thank you so very much. A big shout to uh, the Stuart Bros. Give it up for them, y'all. <laughs> This is the third time they uh, invited me, and they're using the same damn picture. I do not look the same. I'm just messing with y'all. I'm messing with y'all. It's, it's a joke. Lighten up, okay? We don't get to some serious stuff, but it's okay for y'all to laugh. It's all good. Where all the alphas at? Uh, all right, the rest of you. The, the, oh, six. Now, the rest of y'all who now the rest of y'all belong to a youth group, you don't get shout outs. So it's all good. Let's get, let's get right into it. Uh, we want to bring out our panel right now. First and foremost, uh, you have already uh, heard her, the Deltas, uh, uh, shout her out. Uh, yeah, no, my, I know my wife's here, Delta. I know. I give y'all a shout out too for Iron Deltas. Okay. All right. There you go. Only because of the wife. Fine. Longtime leader of Essence Magazine, she of course also National Cares and Mentoring uh, Movement. That's what I call it, the National Cares Mentoring Movement. She's the founder of that as well. Uh, she's the queen of black America. And ain't no way in hell she is 70 plus years old. Black don't crack at all. Give it up for Susan Taylor. Right there in the middle, right there in the middle, right there in the middle. Mm -mm, you're in the middle, you're in the middle. I'm going to give it up for Kefra, her husband. See, anytime a black man looking good, y'all always go, girl, your husband, oh, the wife, she get taken care of him. Y'all, Susan looking so good because Kefra got it on lockdown. So I, I always give Kefra a shout out because, you know, a brother look good, y'all don't give him no credit. It's always the wife. Woman look good, brother gets no credit. All right, next up, folks, uh, you have uh, uh, seen him. Uh, on a television, uh, on radio, uh, he has more big ass words than the dictionary. <laughs> In his spare time, he actually goes to look for 12 letter words to use on television. <laughs> and in truth, he's really a frustrated rapper. Put your hands together for Dr. Michael Eric Dyson. <laughs> Mm -mm. Now you same boat. <laughs> All right. Our next guest, our final uh, panelist here, of course, uh, you have known him for years, uh, leader of the National Action Network. You've seen him talking politics nation on MSNBC. Uh, many of you might recall back in the day when he was kicking it with James Brown. The man who at once time had his own line of velour track suits. Put your hands together, Reverend Al Sharpton. <laughs> Y'all, true story. That was it last year on the Tom Jordan Morning Show cruise? We, we do these superheroes characters, and they had me dressed up. And I don't even know what they're going to have. I just go in like, okay, I'll wear whatever y'all pick out. I walk in, I say, well, who am I this year? They said, uh, you old Al Sharpton. 
I said, read that picture. He's like, oh, I'm going to get y'all. I saw the photo. I'm going to get y'all. All right, let's get, let's get right uh, into it. In 25 years, we will be a nation that's majority people of color. By 2043, 53% of America will be uh, Latino, Black, Asian, Native American. 47% will be white Americans. From the black perspective, are we ready to assume that demographic power? Anybody can jump in. Red. Well. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> it's just three of y'all. Well, we're not, <laughs> you know, we're not ready, but we're getting ready. Hmm. We have to believe that we are aware of all the places in which we're hurting, the places where we are weakened, and, you know, we were to open with little statements, and I'm not going to make a statement. What I want to do, Roland, and there's a video that I'm going to ask that we play, because what really rests in my heart and hurts it every day is the number of our children and families who are living in poverty. And beyond our view, our middle class view, because we're mostly middle class here, there's the pain of poverty, living in shelters, going to schools without any of the supports that our children have, and so much more. Violence. I grew up in a Harlem and never heard a gunshot when I was growing up. All of these things create trauma, and we expect children who are growing up in trauma to perform in ways that children who grow up in lovely suburbs with all the fine things that children should have the supports that they need. We compare children who have none of those things to children who have those things in multiples. And so what I wanted to do was really look at the roots of black poverty and for us to understand who we are and why we're in the condition we're in. So I'm gonna ask that they cue up that video. It's narrated by Danny Glover and my husband wrote it. I've been speaking about it across the country and I asked him to put, put it together. So can we show that, Roland? That's really my time. Rather than speaking, I wanted to show this. Press play. Today. <laughs> huh? All right, video not ready. We're gonna come back to your video. Okay, come back to the video. Reverend Sharpton, the question I asked, are we prepared, are we ready to assume that level of power having demographic numbers, but will we be, will we be ready, black America? Well, I, I think that really pivoting off of what Susan said is that it's first we've got to come into ourselves. If we have a minority complex and we become the majority, It'll be almost like in the Bible when Moses sent out Caleb and the crew to check out the promised land and they came back saying to us they appeared as giants right. and we as grasshoppers. We have been psyched into acting like minorities even in cities where we're the majority or where we are a substantial part of the population. For example, we are two-thirds black and Latino of the population in New York and only had one black male and get none of the pension funds investments with our financial services people, allow people not to advertise in our media. So are we going to be ready will be gauged by are we ready now. That's why I think what Susan's doing or uh, that's so important with mentoring is uh, Dice and I was talking in, in, the, in the green room. One of the reasons that I was always considered bold is by growing up in the black church under some premier black preachers, because I started preaching as a little boy, I never knew white folks in charge, because I grew up where black folks signed the check. So I never, I never got a check, a paycheck, from white folks until I was 55 at MSNBC. Oh, right. I never had a white boss. So that I didn't know my place. Mm. And I think that as a race, 
we will be ready when we didn't know our place. But at the same time, it was because I had a black mother who ended up raising me single mother after my father left, who gave me to black men. I was raised by Reverend William Jones, Reverend Jesse Jackson. So by me seeing these images, and then at 18 meeting James Brown, I never managed James Brown, I was like his son. And when I, reason the mentoring program is so important to me, is when James Brown said to me one day, I was visiting him in Augusta, he said, y'all out there marching, You've been marching all your life. He said, I can talk to the president. I said, well, you should go tell him we need Martin Luther King's holiday. He told the secretary, get the president on the phone. I said, yeah, right. So to my surprise, five hours later, White House called back. And next thing I know, we're going to Washington to meet Ronald Reagan, 1982. I was, nobody knew who I was, I was in my 20s. He on the plane, I rarely talk about this in public, but I'm sitting next to Susan Taylor and mentoring. On the plane going up there, he said, when we land, I want to go by Mr. Edwards' place. I said, oh, whatever you say, Godfather. He said, I want you to do your hair like mine. I said, you want me to do what? And he said, I want you to do my hair like mine. I said, why? He said, because when we go to White House tomorrow, when they see you, I want you, them to see me. You like my son. Well, nobody knew the reason I did my hair and maintained it now is no man ever asked me to look like them. I didn't have a father. And it meant everything to me that I felt worthy that some man wanted me to be there. So what was a style to cartoonists was an affirmation to me. To hear was the biggest entertainer in the world wanted me whose daddy had not come to see him in 20 years, wanted me to look like him. That's what we've got to put in our kids. We have to affirm them, and then we'll be ready. Michael, when we, we talk about, again, 2043, my greatest fear is that we will be like South Africa, where you will have numbers, right. but you won't have economic power. That's right. You might have political power. When you look at the fact that, depending upon what happens in less than 30 days, That's right. we may have, for the first time, uh, 50 plus members of the Congressional Black Caucus. That might result in a black speaker of the House. Right. Uh, you look at all, you might have three black governors mm -hmm. elected in one year when you haven't had three black governors elected since Reconstruction and, uh, in all of those years. That still is my fear that we'll have those numbers combined with Latinos and Asians, but won't be able to have the economic power. And if you want to understand America, you got to understand the money. Absolutely. Well, it's just great to be here at the Brothers Stewart's. Um, Brothers Stewart, they, they've been uh, phenomenal. The city were two American icons. Susan Taylor still looking gorgeous and brilliant and amazing, right? As, as Roland and as uh, Reverend Sharpton said, the queen of black America, because for many of us who grew up, she was the iconic representation of black women. Before there was black women magic, there was Susan Taylor and Essence right? Magazine, right? And Reverend Sharpton, I mean, we sit in the green room. This is a man who's preaching at six years old with Mahalia Jackson, right? Mahalia Jackson, Adam Clayton Powell right, mentored him before he met then Martin Luther King Jr. and then mentored by Reverend Jesse Jackson. This ain't no sprinter, this is a long distance runner right here, right? And I mean, listen to his story of follicular fidelity. Right? And how many letters is that? How many letters is that word? Just, I'm, I'm going to get to you in a minute. Ahead, Hold on. Go ahead. So, so <laughs> and, and to show, right, that people dismissing him, that's why I say, put a, put a silhouette of Al Sharpton next to George Washington and tell me the difference. Right? He had presidential potential in his silhouette from the time he began using his hair that way, not just James Brown. And then this guy right here, I call him the Black Ryan Seacrest. <laughs> right? 
He knows every darn thing about media. He is on top of the digital game like you will not believe. He is on top of the terrestrial game. He can do television, he can do radio, and he is an intellect of the first order. And this man should have his own show right now. There's no doubt about that. There's just no doubt about that. Um, you're absolutely right, Roland. I went to Guyana 15, 20 years ago to negotiate a truce of sorts between the Afro-Guyanese and the Indo-Guyanese because the Afro-Guyanese had the political power, but the Indo-Guyanese had the dough. Mm. Then, now, Indo-Guyanese power and purse string. And so your point about apartheid is right here. The irony is, is that black genius, black sweat, black insight has made America what it is today, right? Can you imagine America without black people? Ralph Ellison said, what would America be without the Negro? Without, without LeBron James, without Victor Oladipo, if we're gonna get local, right? <laughs> Right? What, what, what would it be without James Brown, Susan Taylor, Al Sharpton, Roland Martin? What would it, would it be without Jesse Jackson? Even what would it be without Kanye? <laughs> right? A lot saner. But what's interesting is that, but even Kanye, early Kanye, five albums, some of the greatest music you've heard in American history, some of the most powerful assertions of black intelligence, we need to make Kanye sit down to listen to Kanye, <laughs> right? I'm not jumping on, and I'm gonna answer your question, I'm not gonna jump on his choice of wife. The Kardashian girls have tried to save more Negroes than the NAACP. <laughs> but here's my point, that the point- And they Roland, destroy more Negroes than more the Republican National Ain't Convention. no doubt, ain't no doubt about sorry, that. But... Well, the jury's out on half of them. But what's interesting, <laughs> but let me answer your question. So there is no question that our black genius has undergirded American capital. Not just American expressive culture, not just American empire, but the very existence of America rests upon black ingenuity. The plans for Washington, D.C., the blueprints that were laid, the labor that was put, in, put forth. So yes, the real tragedy will be, as Ms. Taylor said, getting ready, and as Reverend Al Sharpton said, understanding our position, we have in one sense marginalized ourselves. First of all, we've not taken advantage of helping each other, right? We still, we still think the white man's water is wetter. We still think when, if a black person mess up one time, I ain't gonna deal with them niggas no more, right? You go to a white man that hurts you, another white man that hurts you less, another white man that hurts you a little less, a white woman that hurts you a lot, a white woman that hurts you, you just keep on using white folk because whiteness is the default position of your psychological deference to a culture that is alien from you. Now, I'll end by saying this. So demographically, we will be right in terms of collectively with Latinos who have outstripped us in terms of minority status. And the black-brown tension has to be recognized, but the black-brown coalition has to be realized. And in that sense, right, let, let's, not be, let's not lie, a lot of Mexicans come over here with the notion that we are at the bottom of the totem pole. And the first thing you do to become an American to cement your status is not learn the Constitution, but learn how to dog black people. So we know that there are some racist elements in Mexico, but we also know we bought hook, line, and sinker some of the xenophobic passions of America that tells us it's the Mexican that is the problem. It's not the Mexican, it's not the Puerto Rican, it's not the Dominican, it's not the Cuban, it's the right-wing Republican that is killing us together. So what you and I have to do very quickly, we have to recognize that demographically with that shift, we got to help each other. We got to generate consensus among ourselves. We all ain't got to agree, but let's turn to each other and help each other and build each other's business. What did Jay-Z say? I'll be damned if I'll take some crystal as long as Puff has what? Chirac. So if Puff has Chirac, buy Chirac. If Roland Martin has unfiltered, subscribe to and support unfiltered. That's what we've got to do. And when we do that, 
We generate enough infrastructure to support the genius we already have. If America loses black people, it loses its soul. But in the meantime, black people have to regain ourselves. And I'll end by saying this. We got a white boy in office right now that shows you anything can be done by anybody. Right? This man is unmolested by enlightenment, untrammelled by insight, a sexual predator, a pimp of the first order, and he's still president of the United States of America. Anything is possible, and we got to seize the day. Roland, Roland, Go ahead. can we see if the video is ready? The video ready? Is the video ready? Look back. This is the truth of who we are. The villages and communities of our African forebears were bound by the belief that family and the elders were to be revered, that all endeavor was for the children, for they mattered most. But the pillaging of resources of people over centuries destroyed black lives and their civilizations. This is the truth of what happened to us, the story rarely told captured and cargoed to the Americas, enslaved Africans and their Caribbean, South, Central, and African-American descendants endured well over 250 years of forced labor. We are the benefactors of the Western world's enormous wealth, the uncompensated lifelong labor on which capitalism was built on the lands appropriated from the indigenous people, resilient, we survived to see emancipation and during Reconstruction made greater strides in a shorter period of time than any group in the history of this nation. African Americans acquired land, built churches and businesses, established black colleges and universities, elevating lives and serving in Congress. But today millions of African Americans exist in the grip of poverty and the lies and stereotypes of black pathology used to explain it. That dream-crushing poverty is not the result of black pathology, but the cause of it. It is a poverty not of ambition or industry, but of means, a poverty rooted deeply in the denial of opportunity, legalized injustices, underfunded inferior schools, and the inherited disadvantage of more than centuries of lost income. Today, black pain and poverty are criminalized and our young are murdered with impunity by those pledged to protect and serve. Policing in the United States begins with the slave patrols, organized to protect property. Black people were property. Post-emancipation, the incarceration of black men becomes a way around the abolition of slavery Chain gang labor and convict leasing programs marked the birth of the prison industrial complex. Sharecropping virtually re-enslaved black families for generations. The black codes and vagrancy laws ensured that black men who could not find work would be arrested, imprisoned, and forced back into slave labor. Domestic terrorism begins with the KKK and the thousands of lynchings of black men, women, and children. Poll taxes, literacy tests, intimidation, and murder keep black people from the polls. Redlining denies us loans and banking services, barring those avenues to building wealth. Prosperous black communities in Chicago, Atlanta, East St. Louis, Rosewood, Florida, and the storied black Wall Street of Tulsa, Oklahoma, are burned to the ground in envy. Aid to families with dependent children creates the fatherless black household with the mandate that no adult male can reside in the home. Mafia drug cartels target black communities with heroin, the CIA with crack cocaine. But nothing in recent times has wrecked greater devastation than the war on drugs, targeted, arrested, convicted by white juries, handed lengthy sentences for offenses that got others a slap on the wrist. Generations of young, poor, black, and brown people have been disappeared behind walls of a for-profit system of mass incarceration. Incomes were lost, black families and communities destroyed. 
lost also with the wisdom, traditions, and know-how that are passed from parent to child. This is who we are, and this is how we got here. But the truth of black existence and resilience always struggles to the surface. The young we serve in 58 U.S. cities are mostly the offspring of those whose lives were torn asunder. They are the children most in need of the village we are rebuilding. Hear them speak for themselves about the efficacy of group mentoring with CARES trained leaders, psychologists, social workers, and volunteer mentors. See how CARES culturally anchored and proving curricula are changing and nourishing their lives. I wanted, I wanted us to see that because we don't know our story. We don't know what happened to us. We don't know, we don't have an understanding of all the barriers that have been put before us to prevent us from what? From thriving. At every turn, there's been a backlash. So we are the most highly educated, the most affluent black people on this planet. We are so fortunate. What we don't have, we have everything except each other, except one another, except, you know, what we're talking about tonight. We have to come together, not just to hear brilliant speakers, and I'm flanked by brilliance. We have to come together like this regularly to lift up our history and our culture for our children to understand who they are. Because when black boys know who they are, they're gonna pull up their pants and run the world. And that's people's fear. But without our history, without knowing our history and what happened to us, right? We believe those images that our young people are bombarded with, that we are thugs. You know, that we just like, we don't do anything right. As Michael was saying, that white people's everything is better than ours. I believe that we have to push from the congregation to the pulpit. That our sanctuaries need to be open, not just for worship service. I mean, we, you know, we can praise God at home. And sometimes we're in there praising God and we're raising $50,000 for pastor's 50th anniversary. But the children around the corner don't have books. So I'm saying it's a, it's a moment. This has got to be a time, Rowan, if we're going to be ready 20 years from now. We have to awaken. It's a moment of awakening, not just conversation, but having a plan and coming together with our egos behind us. And really, if Roland, Roland, what do you need to have a show? What must we do? What must we do for you to have a show? Well, you know what we allow? We have sent a message to all the entities in this nation. You can treat black folk any way you want. You can over-incarcerate our children. You can remove shows from some of the most talented people of our race on television and fill that same slot with mediocrity and lower ratings. This is our fault, not theirs. I'm not pointing the finger at anybody. I'm looking in the mirror. Tell us what we must do. Well, I think when you talk about uh, media, you can look at this from a couple of perspectives. One, you can challenge mainstream media to say, okay, who are the folks that you're, if it's about talent, if it's about work ethic, if it's about relationships, uh, then that's one conversation. So that's, that's mainstream, okay? Uh, and so then now you talk about black media. We've got to be willing to tell black media, don't only feed us comedy shows and award shows. If you, if you want us to keep watching, you've got to give us something else. The fact that, that, there's, that, that there's not a single black network that has even a one hour show out of 172 hours in a week, what that says that you can't even do one hour, that's a problem. Because at least we could go to black media and say we got a voice. That, Black newspapers got us through, black radio got us through. Uh, and the third piece now is on the digital side. White media in newspaper looked the same when radio and television came on. Now, digital is looking the same. We now should be saying to Facebook, to Twitter, to YouTube, we're over indexing on all of your platforms. We're actually making you rich Where's the black content that you're funding? Because they're funding content. They're not funding black content. It's non-existent. And I've talked to them. 
and I've created the digital platform that nobody can say it's not quality. They can't say that. So I'm going to take away all of your excuses, but then the last part also has to be we've got to fund our freedom. We've got to be willing to say, yes, I'm going to support you with $50. Because your cable bill, you're paying $200 a month, and you're not being fed, but you say you want to be fed. So those things actually have to happen. Uh, and so I'm not begging mainstream media for a show. I created the digital show because I said, one, by creating it and controlling it, I then can determine if I want to tomorrow have a one hour sit down with one of you, we can do that, or we can do something different, or we can go live. But that's also why I did that. Reverend Sharpton, go ahead. No, I think uh, that we need a combination yes. of all of that. Uh, you remember in the late 90s, there was what was called the Cats Memo. Yep. And a person from a radio station came to me and gave me at National Action Network the Cats Memo. The Cats Memo was a media group called Cats Media that would, ad that would advise the top advertisers on how to buy the advertising. And they said, don't project a lot on black-owned media. You want prospects, not suspects. It's called Urban Dictate. Urban Dictate. They brought it to me. I called the march because National Action Network meets even now every Saturday morning, which I got from Breadbasket. I don't care where I am, I'm home Saturday morning, so I don't have to give up troops. We meet every Saturday. And we went down, marched on Madison Avenue, started meeting with advertisers, which is what he's saying, and told them not only will we stop buying your product, we elected members of the city council that said we will not zone you in the city. So you got politics correlated with those of us that can mobilize in the streets. That has to mobilize also with supporting uh, platforms of black owned. That's how we got them to come in, Pepsi, to advertise in Essence and Ebony and others. 99 from the Madison Avenue Initiative. We don't do that anymore. Now when we go for it, they say, oh, uh, Reverend Allen, them shaking folk down. No, they're shaking us down. They're taking our money, advertising on white media, and then we wonder why all we see is black women tearing each other's wigs off or, 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 or whatever you call them, and, and not having intelligent shows. And then when one or two break through, like a tamarind they put off, if I get a show, why well, Rem Al on TV? Well, I was trained by Jesse Jackson, who had a show on CNN for right. 10 years, if you knew your history. We're continuing stuff. And we've got to, again, as she said, know who we are. Right. This is a continuation, not the beginning. But if they change and don't tell us our story, and we think we recreated every generation, so we get to Ferguson because the family called us and they done tricked some young folk into saying, I ain't grandma's movement. No, grandma took us from the back of the bus. You just broke a window. Right. You don't know what grandma's movement was. We've got to be the continuation of a long chain of great folk rather than think we got to undo something and not be what we have become. And that's why I make the point about you, we can, the reason I keep saying the next 25 years, because we are marching towards a situation where we're gonna be asking someone else to tell our story, to tell right. our narrative, and then that has never ever served anybody well. But I do wanna bring this point up because I wanna bring up. Go back. No, I'm not moving on. I'm actually, no, I'm not being one because I'm actually about to solidify your point. Let me just go back to what Reverend Al said. We are unconscious consumers. Unconscious consumers. We just, buy, and we overconsume. In the 1970s, there was a very, very popular fragrance, Jungle Gardenia. Anybody remember it? I remember. Okay. Black women overconsumed it. Ed Lewis, one of the founders of Essence, went to the manufacturer, the company that made that fragrance, and said, you know, black women, we love that, they love the fragrance, you should be advertising in essence. You know what this very well-known white man said to Ed Lewis? We know who buys our product. We know that black women buy more of it per capita than any other, you know, women. But we would never advertise it directly to, white, to black women. Because black women aspire to have things beyond their reach, beyond their means. 
And if we ever brought it directly to them, guess what? It would lose its allure. And also, white women might not want it. You never, when you don't see yourself present, first of all, we could change all of this, Roland, by writing letters. If one congregation got together and decided, oh, you know what? This is where we're spending our dollars. You're not advertising on a show that matters to us. Your show, your show, or your show. It would change immediately because it's all about the money. It's not about anything else. It's about that bottom line, and they want to sell that product. And if you said you're not going to buy it and enough people said that, it would shift. But we have to organize that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And very often we have faith institutions that are afraid of that because that money is coming in from wherever, building the things that we do need in our community. And you said it, say it again. Who's going to support this regeneration, the rebuilding of our community? Nobody's going to do that for us. There's a long history. You know, I, the demonization of black men, daddies who leave, let that video stay in your heart. There is no person, man or woman, who cares about, there's no parent who doesn't care about a child. But a system, a system has really turned black men against themselves, and there's never been a positive plan for a man. That, we didn't tell the whole story, but there was a time when you could not get welfare if a man was in the house. Black men have never made incomes that were commensurate with white men's incomes. So brother, sisters always had to work, right? So daddy, now here comes the welfare lady. So what does daddy do? Daddy has to scoop. All of his stuff is, is, has to be removed. He goes on and starts another family. He's already broken from what you saw, from being beaten and overworked and called a boy and out of his name and hated. So we have to understand, understanding is the most important word. When, what is his story? If daddy is gone, what is his story? Why did he go? Why did he start another family? He didn't just come to life like that. Circumstances have really impacted on us in ways that we will never know until we start coming together and having these dialogues and telling our history. So I want to bring up this. Because if we're talking about in terms of, you know, how do we uh, change this tide, uh, I believe you go back to basics. Um, I know some people say, oh, that's old school. Yeah, but it's amazing how a lot of old school stuff works. Um, so this year we lost Dorothy Cotton. Dorothy Cotton was the highest ranking woman in Southern Christian Leadership Conference. Um, I had the opportunity, I think probably, uh, I had the last sit down interview with her in February. She died in May. But a lot of people don't realize she was over the citizenship education program for SCLC. And most people think about that because they think about only in voter empowerment, but that was not their sole job. In her book, and she talked about it with me as well, they would, you, when you were coming to, you couldn't, you couldn't just say, I'm gonna be an SCLC and you go to a march. You had to go through her program first. That's right. But beyond the voting piece, she said what they did was, they, everybody would come in, they would assess all of them mentally to see and hear all of the stuff you just talked about. Then they would empty that out of them, put new stuff into them, then send them through SCLC. Right. So if we're talking about how do we move forward, where do we go, how do we start, I do believe a huge part of this has to be a reprogramming of black America. Man, I, I mean. A reprogramming yeah. yes. of black America yeah. Because, and, and, because I'll, and I'm, I'm going to use this as this example, and Mike, I want you to pick it up. Brother hit me up. This actually happened to me several times. But a brother said, man, when are you going to get your own show? I said, well, I'm on five days a week on TV One. He said, no, 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 no. A real show. Oh, man. I said, I'm sorry, what do you mean a real show? He said, oh, I mean like MSNBC, CNN, one of those networks. And I said to him, I said, brother, you, do you know that when, at the time, Brian Williams was the anchor, do you know when he comes to D.C. to anchor the NBC Nightly News, he literally sits in the exact same chair I sit in? He says, what do you mean? I said, well, we do the show at NBC News Channel. Same chair, same set, same mm. walls, same background. Good God. I said, we send the show through a fiber optic cable the same way they do. Good God Almighty. Threw up a satellite the same way they do. Good God. I said, you think that I don't have a real show 
when it's the exact same show he's doing, except he's doing NBC Nightly News, I was doing News One Now, and he literally said it wasn't real. That is programming, Michael. It is, it is. I mean, it can't be more clearly seen when we've had all of these lessons about internalized racism and self-abnegation, self-hatred, and thinking. That's what I meant when I said the white man's water is wetter. So Brian Williams, and no disrespect to Brian Williams, because Brian Williams put me on in a major way in terms of Hurricane Katrina. He, he went down there, he actually sat with it. So I love Brian Williams. But he's comparing them to Brian Williams, who was demoralized because of his fall from grace, and Lester Holt then got in his space but we got one of the most intelligent and formidable journalists of the last 25 years, and you don't think his show is real? I mean, so, so think about what we're, we're dealing with here. Uh, and plus, you ain't got access. You can't hit Brian Williams up, but you hit Roland Martin up, because he's accessible to his people. Let me tell you something, and, and I'm, I'm so glad Roland raised this, because I have this problem everywhere I go. And I tell black people, you know, I was sitting on a panel. It was a two-man panel, me and Taylor Branch. When I was at the University of North Carolina Chapel Hill, you know his three-volume yep. uh, story of, of America through Martin Luther King Jr., my two books on King. And somebody came at, because I, I was saying backstage, black people, the only people in the world, complain and kvetch and bellyache about talking and about panels and what we going to do besides that. Like, that ain't something serious because if you had more of them and in more intelligence to transmit knowledge, if you went to school more, if you studied your people more, if you look at what white folk are doing, which are using panels to create paradigms to block your black ass out, <laughs> right? This is what they, they use their intellectuals. We excuse ours. We don't need all that highfalutin Negro, you do. <laughs> And let me tell you, Taylor Branch said, oh, but excuse me, Martin Luther King Jr. spent the lion's share of his time doing what we're doing right here. You, you, you remember him? No, we're going to move ahead now. And we've got to strategize about overcoming. Can we get, he talked, he thought. He had a PhD for a reason, not to show off, but to have the critical tools of analysis available to him to engage in reason defense of vulnerable populations. When I got young black folk coming to me, why you be using all them big words? I said to keep white folk from giving you big sentences. <laughs> right? And so I, for one, am tired of black people apologizing for engaging in the very thing that Miss Taylor spoke about and Reverend Sharpton spoke about. How you gonna know if you ain't taught? How are you gonna know your history? They're not gonna teach it to you in the major white schools. It's antithetical to their own survival. My school, Georgetown, is just now reckoning with 272 slave, enslaved black people. They weren't slaves, they were enslaved. They were enslaved. They made money off of them. When the university was in a pinch, they sold those 272 people and Georgetown was able to succeed. Now we're no, just no. now- Georgetown able to survive. Survive, succeed, and prosper. Yes. Right? Based upon the selling of black flesh. We do not know our story. If we go back and understand what Ms. Taylor presented on this screen here, that Kefra Burns brilliantly articulated, the pathologization of black people, the demonization of dark skin, the stigma of our African identity. If we could, as Roland said, reprogram program ourselves by unlearning all of the madness and the mental disease that has been transmitted to us. So I'm tired of black people saying, what we gonna do besides go to a panel. Negro, go to a panel, learn something, talk about it, learn what books we talk about, what essays we're referring to, because I tell you what, I write books like niggas write hooks. And, and yes, I'm telling you if a rapper can stand on stage and recite verbatim something he never wrote down, a piece of literature 
God forgive me for my brass delivery, but I remember vividly what these streets did to me. Imagine me allowing you to nitpick at me, portray me like a pickany. Jay-Z said, now all my teachers couldn't reach me and my mama couldn't beat me hard enough to match the pain of my pop not seeing me. So, look at that iambic pentameter. Look at that cultural convention. Look at that enjambment. Look at that prosody. Look at that internal rhyme. Look at that external rhyme. If you would respect the intelligence of a Roland Martin, he got a real show with real people, with real intelligence, with real news that makes something different to us, we could change this world. So what we have to do is respect us enough. I'm going to tell you, and I'll be in here. I make money from white folks so I can share it with Negroes. I ain't lying to you. I'm, I'm a one man United Negro College fund. You understand? Because, and, and look, look, I, I, I still work with the white man. People say, how come your teacher Howard? They ain't invited me. And the white man pay on time. Stop, stop. I'm not with you. Right? I'm trying to live my best life. I ain't going back and forth with you. So, but because black institutions are underfunded, starved, systematically denied, I give to them at lower cost what I take from the white man at the top dollar. And so now when I see Negroes, what you gonna be this, uh, do besides read a book, besides writing a book? Nigga, write one yourself. And then when you learn to write a book and a sentence, when I write books, everything I do is extra. Everything I do is because of God's grace. Everything I do is because I'm in love with black people. I got a love affair with black people that can never be broken. I am in love with you. I love you so much I work myself to death because I believe that our ability to survive must be told to our people. That's what I do. Part of the part of the programming is that not only don't a brother see your show is real, we get angry at those that stand up for us. So they will shoot somebody. Family will call me and black folks will say, what are he coming to town for? Come on, Come on, Half my time, I got to fight with Negroes on why I'm fighting for them. So, and then you, you, you have a Dyson having to deal with why he write a book or you why you do what you do. If we would just get out each other's way, but we don't even understand we are programmed right. to fight each other. Who do you think you are? Mm -hmm. And if we would really stop and look at that, and, and it, one of the things you, you talked about uh, uh, how we had to go through training in the movement, one of the things I was told is you are not gonna ever get credit till you're gone. Dr. King, people, people don't realize it. Dr. King never knew how much he was on. Never saw him on with King Street. He was at a low level in the polls among blacks when he got killed. His last march, when he went to Memphis. Low 30%. That's right. When he went to Memphis to help the, uh, the, uh, the uh, strikers, yep. young blacks started a riot at his march. He came back to Memphis to prove he could have a nonviolent march, and that's when they killed him. We've been taught to fight those that stand out, and that's how deep the programming is. So you're absolutely right. We've got to deal with the deep programming because we've been taught, they will say, guy asked me today, well, what do you do? I landed uh, uh, in, uh, at the Indianapolis airport. And a uh, brother got off the plane and said, Ramel, I, I couldn't talk to you sitting in first class. I said, well, I don't ride the back of nothing in honor Rosa Parks. I'm always in first class. <laughs> and <laughs> he said to me, yeah, well, I know you come out here to raise some hell and get in the paper. I said, first of all, I don't need to go nowhere to get, I got my own show. I can stay home and be on TV. But it's the psyche that we have 
that if somebody white come to town, we're honored right. if they come to fight. But if we come, we're under suspicion. Right. White men tell a lie is believable. Black men tell the truth is questionable. That's how we live. And we've got to stop that. And we've got to stop those that do benefit from the fight have got to acknowledge that. I told her this and I'll cut, I'll end there. I told her at Dyson's church and Reverend, he does go to church. You go to Alfred Street Baptist Church. Black corporate white, I mean a black corporate conservative executive said to me, Reverend Al, I don't believe in all that marching and protesting you do. I know y'all got some laws changed, racial profile stuff at first, but I don't believe in that. Look at my resume. I got where I got because of where I went to school and the connections I got. Civil rights didn't write my resume. Read my resume. And I looked at it and I said, yes, very impressive. And you're right. Civil rights didn't write your resume. But civil rights made somebody read your resume. <laughs> you are not, you're not the first qualified Negroes in America. Don't ever forget when you come downtown in Indianapolis tomorrow to work or go wherever you go, there were some unleaded, undegreed grandmas that laid down in the gutter and went to jail to sponsor you. That's what we need to program. And so if we're talking about taking all of these different things, as uh, Chuck D, uh, I just interviewed him last week uh, in uh, Los Angeles, and what he says is that the last piece of real estate that cannot be sold is in between your ears. Uh. And so, uh. under understanding that, uh. let's say we go through reprogramming. Let's say within families, let's say within our freedom schools, let's say uh, within churches, we begin to do that. I do think if we, have, if we look at the three most fundamental things that speak to our issues in America, Maynard Jackson articulated those which came from his grandfather, the three Bs, the ballot, the book, and the buck. So I want to deal with the book first, then I'm going to deal with the ballot second, and then I'm going to deal with the buck third. In terms of the book, it's interesting to me when we have this, this, this battle going on right now with public education. Uh -huh. I have a lot of folks who they say, Roland, why do you support charter schools? I said, I support anything that works. Uh -huh. What I mean by that is charter, public, online, traditional, magnet, homeschool, online school. I don't care technical school. I don't care what it is. As long as it works, how do we return to, the, to this this mentality where there is nothing that will get in the way of your little behind getting an education. If you read James D. Anderson's book, The Education of Blacks in the South, 1860 to 1935, after slavery, 92% of all black kids in Memphis were in school, 41% of white kids in D.C. You had this fervor, this undeniable fervor. You meet, you, you can meet black people who raised kids in their 30s, 40s, and 50s. They had 15 kids and all went to college. And they never made more than $8,000 a year. So how do you, the three of you, from your vantage point, get us to get to back to that point where education is flat out the most critical thing that we do for our kids between the moment they're born and when they're 18? Mm. The book. Let's deal with that. You know, we know that. We know that education is the key. And that's the reason why there is no city, no hamlet, no rural area where there are poor black people where the educational system works. Nowhere. That's the huge barrier. And it's purposeful. And we know it and we allow it. So I'm not looking at them. I'm looking in the mirror. I'm looking at myself and I'm looking at you. As long as education is funded by property taxes also, and you don't own any property and you'd be poor, how, this, how are the schools gonna be funded? So you see all the goods and the riches going to suburban schools, our children having nothing. I'm working on the south side of Chicago. We're in 58 cities. And we think that Indianapolis Cares is going to start again here. Two sisters have stepped up. 
and I hope it's going to happen. You know, anybody who's interested in really working with us, we're working in the schools. We're working in a school. We've been in there in Chicago. Michael's been there twice. Five years. And I've seen both principals lose three million dollars in a school that is grossly underfunded over five years. The community has done nothing about it. They probably don't even know it. I don't think it's being spoken about from any pulpit. We have to awaken. This is what we should be speaking about in church. The Holy Spirit doesn't need you to go to church and praise His holy name. You could do that at home. What we have to do is awaken and use, I mean, preach, yes, and give us the word, yes. But what's the plan? Give us the plan and the word, and let us work together to say, okay, that school, if you don't, we can, we can take anybody to task if we do this, if we come together. Rowan, this is the last thing I'm going to say. It's understanding. We have to understand that for 250 years, enslaved and post-slavery, we've been taught to hate ourselves. We've been taught to hate our hair, our hips, our lips, our color, everything about ourselves. I'm 72. The worst thing that you could have said to a black kid when we were growing up was you'd be African. African? We hated our motherland. So it's going to take time. That book that came up at the end of the video, it's called The New Way Forward, Healing What's Hurting Black America. That's what we're teaching in schools, creating pilots so that we can replicate it. Not going through that system. The system is never going to allow us to tell our story, ever. We can override that. There's not, a, there's not a sanctuary in any of our communities across the country that is not empty all day long in the middle of the day. On Saturdays, what are we doing? While the Jewish kids are doing their little thing and learning their history and culture, and the Chinese and the Koreans and the Asians, I mean the uh, Greeks, we're out there doing whatever. We need to come into those sanctuaries. So you said there's a plan, so we asked the plan. What's that? If you asked specifically in terms of that, that plan, uh, Mary Wright Elman, the Children's Defense Fund, uh, they have a little toolkit for freedom schools. That, are, that specifically are designed for churches to do exactly what you're talking about. In the summer? No, no. It can be year-round. Do you know any that are now year-round? I know them in the summer. Yeah, yeah, okay. right. There, 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 there are some that actually do it. But Roland, I think you have to push from the congregation to the pulpit. Pastor, we're going to work it out. You know, every congregation is full of teachers and historians and successful people. Come together and let's tell our story. Make sure our children know who they are. That, that's really it. And we have to learn how to love ourselves. We have to learn to, to, to disrespect and disregard black skinned women is to, is to disrespect your ans yourself, yeah. your ancestral mother. Right. We have to hold up the oh, a pure African, the blackest of black person, and say, woo, admire it. We've been taught to hate that. So we have to really be honest with ourselves. There's a whole peeling off of all this stuff, as you've been saying, that's, that's been put on us over the centuries. And we have, there's a process that we have to use to come back to our humanity and to who we are. Reverend Sharpton, when, when I made that point about in terms of where we stand with education in these education systems, uh, when I was speaking in front of one group, I mean, we literally, it was, I mean, I, I was being attacked left and right. Uh, actually, I, I was in Alabama. And his brothers, he said, I just don't understand how you can support charter schools that were created by white folks. I said, is there anything in America that white folks did not create? A lot. I said, so if, if I'm going to not do something because white folks did it, I was like, hell, I'm going to have a problem. What I was trying to get him to understand is that I went to all traditional schools. I ain't never been to private school in my life, but I went to a magnet school. that was a school of communications. And the reason when I went live, I set all the equipment up myself because I was taught that in the magnet school. And I was trying to get him to understand that. I said, brother, if, I, if when Steve Perry, you talk about his school that he's doing with Diddy in Harlem, he controls the curriculum. He controls who gets the contracts. And he controls the education. I said, so I'm not opposed to any traditional school, but if there are traditional schools that are failing our kids, I cannot support failure. No, I think, I think uh, I certainly agree that we ought to engage in whatever works. When, when President Obama was elected and he said to me uh, that he was going to give us the first meeting, he said, what do you want to meet on? I said, we should meet on education. He said, all right, and he had Valerie Jarrett uh, give him a date. 
He says, now who are you going to bring, Reverend Al? I said, I'm going to bring New Gingrich. He said, New Gingrich? He said, yeah. Why? Because, one, I know all these conservatives are going to attack you for meeting with me. They can't attack if Newt's in the room. And we've got to talk about education in a way they won't shoot it down before we get started. You have got to have control of education in your community. When I, in 1968, I was getting ready to go to high school. From junior high school to high school, we couldn't go a month because the fight was over community control of education. That was my uh, year going to high school as a freshman. We, when we lost control of the public schools, you had to experiment in whatever works. If it's charter, if it's magnet, we first got to put an educational climate back into our community where we put in our children the need and the thirst for education. My mother dropped out of school in the junior high school because she's from Alabama. I was born in Brooklyn. She had to pick cotton, but she made me read. My pastor, going to Susan's point, would sit up in his study after service and underline books reading. I'm four or five years old because I'm a boy preacher. I'm sitting there underlining books I couldn't read, but it set a mentality that I grew up wanting to be a reader. And we've got to put that back in our community, that education is important, and that whether we do it charter, whether we do it public, whether we do it magnet, by any means necessary, we must regain our knowledge and thirst for education and reading and studying and not being programmed by a media that is hostile to us, but by digging in the right books and the right, and not just read to be reading, I'm talking about reading the right stuff that will nourish us. That's on us. Michael. No. <clears throat> I, I, I agree with uh, everything uh, that has been said, and think about it. Think about the, the, the stats that we might have uh, overlooked that Roland read in terms of relative um, states of literacy among black people. That shows you if the level of literacy was hyper extend, hyper produced in say right after slavery and then from slavery and reconstruction, reconstruction of this denial and then the remaking of America under Jim Crow. If black people had relatively higher rates of literacy and access then, more people going to college and graduating, it's because the nation's will was bent toward a permission and a tolerance toward black education before they quickly saw it as antithetical to their existence. Because white folk get caught in a paradox. First of all, they clown us for saying we ain't smart, and then when we get smart, they get mad, right? So you gotta regulate. So this is when Ms. Taylor said, it's deliberate, listen to what she's saying. There are deliberate attempts to keep us at lower levels, expelling our kids at five and six and seven and eight, expelling them from schools, girls and boys. Right? Indigenous people and uh, African Americans, the leading figures of, among kids who get expelled. Then, when you put them in detention, that's a warehouse for jail. Jail becomes a feeder system into prison. You are literally marking your kids in the public schools that people want to defend. But as Roland is saying, if we can't find alternative structures and institutions of education, then what we're doing is ransoming our kids toward a future that we will never realize. So I say this, and look, I mean, here we are, my beloved uh, young friend, Dr. Tina Kenshin, Dr. Tina Harris, who was at Princeton with me. I remember the meetings we would have and we would talk these things over and hash them over. And I think about another person from Indianapolis, Tavis Smiley. Tavis put a lot of Negroes on television, put us up on game, made arguments about the nature of the distribution of our resources toward uh, black prospering. Think about all those lessons when it comes to your kids. How can you turn to the same media that demonizes you to listen to what they say about your kids? 
because so many of us imbibe unconsciously, I mean, that beautiful phrase that Ms. Taylor used, unconscious consumers. Mm -hmm. So now we're being bamboozled and hoodwinked to believe our kids are dumb, illiterate, untutored, incapable of learning when they lack opportunity. We say, oh, black kids just want to be ball players and stuff. And white Look, I teach white kids. They want to be Peyton Manning too. <laughs> they they want to do that. But here's the difference. They got options. They got alternatives. They got fallbacks. They got plan Bs. Negroes trying to ball ain't got no plan B, right? So now you want to be a, 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 a basketball player, you want to be a football player, and when that don't come through, because it comes through for 3%, it comes through for a very small percent, then you crap out of luck. Which also, so, which, right. which also, I got to say, which also why you have to have alternative storytellers, because next month, so how many folks know that the number two person in the NBA is a brother. Right, Mark Tatum. Mark Tatum. Right. I'll be sitting down doing an interview with Mark because I've long said we've got to showcase the black agents, the black executives, the right. black accountants right. to say you can still be in the NBA doing just not there. bouncing the ball. Right. Let me. Let, let, great point. And you can be an accountant. And you can be a person, like you said, an agent and on the team itself representing different interests and personnel. Right. So let me end by saying this. So having said all that, you got to distinguish between schooling and education. Right. Schooling is the institutional matrix that receives the impulse to learn. That's very important, right? But you don't want to trust a school with the education of your children. Education is knowledge transmitted with a purpose. And that ain't got to be in no institution. I know all the preachers up here shaking because Miss Taylor has said two times, you can stay at home and worship. I know they're going, Jiminy Christmas, my God, my tithes just went down. What is she talking about? Right? That ain't what she's saying. You know what she's saying. She's saying God can be best served by walking as a verb, not resting as a noun, right? And so, right? And so even reprobate preachers like me, Jack, you can see why I ain't got no church. You, you can clearly see, right? Because I would pass out condoms on the offering plate. But what's interesting to me, right? I give them to the preachers and deacons first, right? Uh, 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 right? Oh, no, 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 no. Of course. I ain't dogging us. Wait a minute. I'm not dogging us. Don't try to clean right? it up. Don't try to clean it up? Okay. I ain't dogging us. I'm specifying. God bless you. <laughs> <laughs> but what I'm saying, oh, oh, cause, cause it ain't like the ladies ain't trying to holler at them. But what's interesting, oh, it takes two to do in the tango. I'm on my point. Me too. So what I'm saying to you, <laughs> what I'm saying to you, is that if we could understand that we have the institutional infrastructure of a church to gather together intentional and purposeful black people to teach our kids. Think about how many more Roland Martins and Susan Taylors and Al Sharptons we could produce. You don't know who you have in your kids. Stop beating them. Stop defeating them. Stop telling them they ain't nothing. Gather them together. And I'll end by saying this. My dream is not simply, as Ms. Taylor said, that one day they'll pull their pants up and fly. My point is one day we'll accept the fact that they ain't got to pull their pants up and can still be great, like Jay-Z, like, like Puffy. So it's not right, as I often say, if you lift their dreams, their draws will follow. If you lift their dreams, their draws will follow. Then they can pull their pants up, put on their manhood and their womanhood, and learn to love each other and not hate each other, and then teach their children. I end by saying this, I have seen it so often when I go out in these communities, there is no lack of knowledge for black people. Every other Negro I meet got a book. Yeah. Hey, can you read my book? Of course, and I met a book from a brother today. Right, tremendous young brother, Brother Shepherd, Shane Shepherd, right? Been in the prison, got out, got his book. Go check him out. Here's my point. Every other Negro I know got a nonprofit, got a book, got a business, and trying to get on. We don't lack desire. We don't lack intelligence. We lack opportunity, and let's give that opportunity to each other. I mentioned the book. I mentioned the book. 
there's been a lot of conversation over the last uh, several months about a study that was done at Duke University. It was called What We Get Wrong About Closing the Racial Wealth Gap. Mm. Uh, and a variety of folks did this report uh, at the Samuel Dubois Cook Center on Social Equity. And so what they lay out is that, and I've had these folks tweet me, and they've said that, oh, you've gotten it wrong when I've talked about focusing on banking black, buying black, right. uh, also talking about uh, black home ownership. And, and essentially what they conclude is that the only way the, the, to deal with the racial gap, the w racial wealth gap in America, uh, is for there to be one, either reparations, or for there to be a trust that is set up by the government that actually those funds go to African Americans. And I go, okay, that's, that's, the, that's the conclusion of the 67 page report. Right. Until that happens. <laughs> right, 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 right. And, and that's just, and, and that's fine. That's right. I read the report, went through all 67 pages, I'm like, yep, I agree, I agree, I agree, I agree. But let me know when they're gonna do that. That's right. In the, as Yolanda Van Zandt's old book, in the meantime. Right, right, right. We talk about the buck. The, we have to contend with to understand America. You better understand money. And no doubt. And we lost 53 percent of our black wealth due to the home foreclosure crisis. Mm -hmm. uh, it would take two more generations to reclaim that money. That's right. Home ownership among black folks right now is about 41 percent down from a high of some 60 percent mm -hmm. and so we're, we're still dealing with that and so when we talk about the buck mm -hmm. moving forward i say again next 25 years what do you say to this audience those who may be watching via the live stream or watching later to begin to confront what's happening with themselves financially and i want to i want to start with susan but i want to start this way with susan you don't check bags anymore because I remember you saying, look, I am not taking vacations and bringing three suitcases. I'm going to go somewhere and wash the same damn clothes as opposed to sitting there keep trying to buy stuff over and over and over again. You, your whole deal is that is a mindset in terms of I'm not trying to dress for somebody else. That's right. That gets to this whole issue of the buck as well because that's still a mental mindset. That's a huge one for us. Go online and look at me. Look at those images. You will see me in this jacket 400 times. <laughs> it is custom made, it is fly, and I just keep wearing it because I am not giving them my, and it's made by a black woman. You know? We have to really wake up and see how we're spending our money. Every dime spent is a political decision made. Mm. Every single dime. Mm. I'm coming back to the sanctuary. I think, am I right? Is the are our sanctuaries the only place of independence we have? No longer. That, no longer. That's where I wanted to go. See, the problem is, and, and we met with uh, uh, about 60 black ministers today, one of the things that they have done to destabilize us is taking the black church. And many of us that complain about the black church don't go. Hmm. And we'll sit home, talk about the black preachers, and watch Joel Osteen. Mm. 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 What we must do is redeem and take back the black church and support it and then fine tune it as, as Susan is saying to go after these things. If every black church, if you got half the black churches, in Indianapolis, this is what we started to deal with in Breadbasket when I was a kid. And we started to organize this Nash Action Network now. We want to take key cities, get 50 black churches and say, we all going to go bank at one bank. Yes. Yes. Every Monday morning, yes. we all going to deposit in one black bank or one uh, bank that we can do business. But here's the deal. In order for us to bank with you, you got to do business loans in our community. You got to deal with student loans. We going to deal with mortgages because we will be putting millions in, but we want to be able to leverage that right. into something for our community. We talk about Jay-Z and them. I remember I brought Puffy to meet James Brown. James Brown said the problem is that y'all are in the show and not in show business. Mm. When he went and met with Nixon, he walked out with FEC 
FCC giving them three radio stations. They go in and come out with colognes that's really not owned by them. Mm. Why aren't you in the business that you in? Isn't it interesting that we are two black entertainers that have owned radio stations, James Brown and Stevie Wonder. And that was 50 years ago. There's not a black entertainer that can exist without airplay and none of them by radio stations. Mm. So we beg for what we, we, we buy what we want and beg for what we need. Mm. And we've got to start having the discipline, as she said, of what we're doing with our dollar. Yes, the black church ought to do more, and we ought to support the black church, and rather than waiting on somebody coming through here telling us something, and then we want the black church to fight for us right. while we give the white evangelists our money. I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go to Michael, then I'm gonna go to questions, and I got you, so, but Michael, we, again, we, 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 I'm gonna combine what Manor Jackson said about the ballot in the book, Right. Because we talk about leveraging. First of all, uh, there's a documentary that is on Netflix. Uh, you need to watch. It's called Maynard. That's a great one. It was done by the Maynard Jackson's family. That's great. If if you think about in the history of America, I am not saying the history of black politics. Right. The history of all politics. I would ar I would argue that if you had a top five, which includes presidents, he was governors. Great mayors, Mayor Jackson would be in that top five. Yeah, because Michael, what he did was, he, the doc documentary lays out, and I've been using him in speeches for 20 years, he called the banks in and said, uh, y'all got no blacks on y'all board. They said, okay, we're not gonna put in there, no, they said there are no blacks who could do these jobs. Right. He said, fine, to the city treasurer, come in, take the city money out their banks. <laughs> then they all of a sudden went out and found black people. <laughs> But what he also did was, he then said, these black companies, because when he broke apart the big contracts, the smaller contracts, you become a prime contractor, because you can't bid on a prime contract, contract unless you've been a prime before, and if you're only a sub, you could never be a prime. He then said, they need lines of credit, you know they have a city contract, extend to them lines of credit because you know we give them a contract. They said no. He said we're going to take our money out of your banks. He leveraged political power. Yes. To, so the reason Atlanta is the black economic mecca it That's is right. is because of Maynard Jackson and just so you know 1973 when he was elected blacks were getting point zero zero one two percent of every one hundred dollars spent in Atlanta which meant that every hundred dollars spent in Atlanta black businesses got yeah, twelve cents. Yeah. He changed that and so again the buck and the ballot forcing our political leaders to say use your leverage right. to drive ec things economically for black folks that's not a quota system because you could say anybody with a city contract that's should right. be able to have a line of credit extended by a particular bank yeah no that's a, that's a brilliant analysis by the way of, of that film Roland just gave it to you uh, in a nutshell do you and you will get cut <laughs> Sneaking up on a black man. <laughs> no, I'm gonna let you go. Go, 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 go. Yeah. Okay, got it. Got it. All right. So, so, okay, got it. All right. <laughs> we almost got cut, y'all. I'm gonna go ahead, Michael. So. Um, and one of the things Major Jackson said, remember when they came to him and said, okay, so tell us who to put on there. He said, oh, you ain't gonna get me caught up in that. Right. I ain't appoint nobody so you can accuse me of some kind of collusion. I'm gonna allow conscience to dictate what you gotta do, but know that the threat of withdrawing that money made folk act right. Um, and that's why it's important, the, the, the cooperation between the ballot and the buck because one of the things you do when you're a politician is you do what? You deliver critical resources to vulnerable populations in a time of crisis. That's what politicians do, right? I got a snowstorm, I got a, a flood, I got a tornado. So much of what gets people reelected, right? Sister Jane in, in Chicago got reelected just by shoveling snow. Delivering critical resources to vulnerable populations in a time of crisis, except a lot of black people don't demand of their political figures the kind of resources that other communities take for granted. 
Jews, Poles, Italians, Lithuanians. It's, you know, they come, they say, look, you're going to be responsible to us. Black people are the only people who, who do politics on credit. Right? We do it on credit. Okay, if you promise the next time, then I'll do it. Whereas other people saying, right now. Right? Gay, lesbian, transgender, bisexual people, right now. Environmentalists, right now. Right? Jewish brothers and sisters lobbying the Israel, or in terms of understanding the expansion of opportunity for them economically, 2.3%, 3.5% of the population, and yet arguing for greater resources. Right? Everybody but us. And those best black political figures, right, like a Reverend Al Sharpton, like a Jesse Jackson, like a Maynard Jackson, like Harold Washington, like Shirley Franklin, right? We can name the, the people who have done extraordinary work, have made sure that their people were taken care of, not outside the system, but from within it. And if I were to deliver, and, and Reverend Sharpton and I have talked about this, if I were to deliver one critique of President Obama is that he might have leveraged his presence there to open up that pipeline so that after he's gone, yep. there was tremendous opportunity left for black people economically. Now we know that he's going to come out as one of the top 10 presidents in history. There's no question about that. In terms of he inherited a, 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 an economy that was bent out of shape going to hell in a handbasket. And this orange apparition, this idiot, this, this, Ill, this unilluminated glob who continues to contend that he is now doing so, he's riding the train Obama put on the track to make it where it is, right? Then Obama bailed out the automobile industry. He literally saved Detroit in a fundamental fashion. And then he gave the TARP money to really meet the need of financial exigency for those who were messed up. And, and he did something controversial. People got mad when he bailed out the banks. But imagine the headlines of the first black president that under him the banks failed. Forget a second term, he wasn't going to get a second day in office. So he saved that. All I'm saying then, praising him for the enormity and the magnitude of what he did, a little attention to hooking up Negroes within the context of that is an extension of what the best politicians have done. So I'll end by saying this, the ballot and the buck have to go together because people who got the money dictate the policy, right? What do you see right now under, under, under uh, this president? Billionaires are setting policy. Multi-millionaires are setting policy of all colors, whether they are black or white. We got Ben Carson up in there, don't know a damn thing about housing. Don't know nothing about what he's doing, but he's setting policy based upon his feelings and not the reality. So I'll say this, the money is critical why what Ms. Taylor said in terms of our own financial responsibility, what we're investing in, the stuff that we're buying, buying stuff that won't be, uh, take uh, a cognizance of us. When Jay-Z finally said, the reason we're not gonna have that certain kind of wine we're gonna uh, take in or that champagne, because they did the same thing. We know uh, that they are drinking our champagne, but we don't care, we don't like those people doing it. So they withdrew that strategically and generated their own. But the reality is, if we're gonna have an economic infrastructure, do you know how many millions and billions of dollars that are generated through our wealth, and yet we are not intentional and purposeful about where we direct those? If we do that, then we have the opportunity to then not only do it economically, but do it in the polls. Can I make this one final plea? Midterm, midterms are coming up. Midterms are just as important as a presidential election. Who your prosecutor is, who your governor is, who your attorney general is. Go vote like your life depended on it because it does. These are the final comments here for each of three, but go ahead, Reverend. One of the things, when we talk about the money as consumers, one of the things, and it hooks right into what has to happen in the midterms, we are financing the breakdown of our own community. We started an initiative in Nash Action Network this year looking at pension funds. They take pension funds. Okay, hold on, stop right there. Who is a public worker? If you are a teacher, a firefighter, a police officer, a city, county, state, federal worker, stand up. 
No, no, no. I want you to stay standing. I want you to stay standing right. because I need, I, I need you to understand the point that Reverend Sharpton is about to make. Reverend, go ahead. They take your pension funds, give it to money managers to invest. The money managers invested with developers that gentrify you out of your own neighborhood and you paying for it. I went to a union. 82% of the union members are black. Not one money managers invest their funds. I'm not talking about what you spend, I'm talking about what come out your check in pensions every week. You never ask them who is managing our funds. And we have people on Wall Street. Roland knows them, mm -hmm. and uh, Dyson knows them. You know Tracy Maitland and others that can invest funds that don't have any union accounts, any municipal accounts, any state accounts. The city of Indianapolis should be using some blacks to invest that money. So grandma will not be financing you taking grandma's house and forcing her out with eminent domain because you would have a money manager working with black developers that would be rebuilding our communities. Before Susan's final comment, you can take a seat. I need you to understand that of the, of the pension funds of the investors on Wall Street, all of you who stood up, you are the largest investors right. in Wall Street. Right. Y'all didn't get it. Pension funds, California Teachers Retirement Fund, right. New York Teachers Retirement Fund, Texas, every pension fund, Wall Street goes to you. So you, you, all y'all who stood up, you are actually financing big business in America and they don't look like you. And if you as pension members, if you as the one, you have the pitches, if you turn around to Reverend Sharpton's point and say, no, 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 y'all gonna start giving money to black hedge funds, to black money managers, they have no choice, cause it's your money. It's your money. And you don't even realize it. Susan Taylor, final comment. Finally. You know, what did you say? The, the ballot, the book, the building, the church. The mosque, the temple. I mean, these are phenomenal speakers, great minds. And then you all are going to go home, and in three days you're going to forget everything that was said. That's just how our minds work. You have brilliance right here, right in this city. And what you have to do is make sure those sanctuaries are open on Saturdays and Tuesday nights and Thursday nights and whenever they are empty so that you come and you speak about the very things we're talking about tonight. What are the schools that are in the region of the church I go to? And how are those children doing? Let me be watchful of that. What's happening with gentrification? What, what about the monies that are ours that are being used to gentrify us out? None of this stuff is going to stick because we don't have a plan. We have to heal ourselves. We have to learn how to trust one another again. We have to learn how to love ourselves and one another again. And that means we have to come together. We just can't come together for the party or to hear, you know, we, black people are natural orators. You can find great black speakers everywhere. We've got to come together strategically and regularly to talk about the very things we're talking about tonight and come out of those meetings with what, Roland? A plan. And then when Susan Taylor said, pulpit to pew, excuse me, pew to pulpit, that's actually what from the pews to the that's actually what Ella Baker, one of the greatest organizers, actually taught. The reason she and Dr. King didn't get along, he believed it was pulpit to pew. She said, "No, it's pew to pulpit." Mm. That's why she was. That's why she was one of our greatest organizers, mm. including Reverend James Lawson, who is still with us. He turned 90 years old last month, mm. and I can't wait that y'all see the conversation I had with him last week in L.A. Michael, final comment. Yeah, Brett. Well, look. I mean, the Black Church is central, right? Yeah, we got a lot of criticism of the black church, but Jeffrey Johnson, my man, Reverend Jeffrey Johnson, y'all know him? Good brother. Right? Bishop at, College. At, <laughs> at Eastern Star, and uh, a tremendous brother doing the very things that Ms. Taylor's talking about. But you know, there's a lot of critique to be made and we should make it, but I believe I'm defensive about that institution as we all are, because we, we wanted to achieve so much more. 
uh, than people have thought it's, that it was capable of achieving. But you know, Robert McAfee Brown, the old theologian said, the church is like Noah's Ark. If it wasn't for the storm on the outside, you couldn't stand the stink on the inside. Right? It's a, lot of, it's a lot of stink in the church, but it's a lot of storm outside. And that's why Ms. Taylor keeps referring to it. I like how she gave that alliteration of the B. She added that fourth B there. That's what black women do. Extend, improvise, and, and add on to. Because they will run stuff even if they ain't on program. Right? <laughs> <laughs> that's what they will do. So, so the building is critical. The church is critical. The, the, the genius you just heard in terms of that financial institution and fiduciary responsibility and the way in which it was broke down is a product of the black church. This man a product of the black church. I came up out the black church. This woman deeply involved in black religion in a fundamental way. All of us owe our lives to spirit. But, 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 but spirit makes religion behave right. We need something that transcends our sectarian binds. And I think that as people who love God and whatever you call God and whatever you refuse to call God, if we come together to understand that as a black people, we are the manifestation of an imagination that very few people could conjure. Howard Thurman, the great preacher said, never reduce your lives to the event that is your immediate experience. This thing right here will not exhaust you. He said our slave foreparents saw something that they couldn't even begin to realize but they knew we were coming. Yes. They felt in their bones that we were coming. If they could do that what more can we do with our intelligence and our inspiration? That's why I love the church, the temple, the synagogue, whether you read the Bhagavad Gita, the Holy Quran, the Tao Te Ching, the Bible, the Hebrew Bible, or comic books, whatever it is that inspires you, allow that inspiration to translate into on the ground stuff. So going to these churches and seeing them used as the potential warehouse of our genius. Imagine if church members who are fund developers, church mm -hmm. members, deacons who are part of the NBA, church members who are part of accountants, if they would teach the people in their local churches, can you imagine the transmission of knowledge Knowledge across the board. And I am by saying this, them churches got dough too. If the black church insists we ain't going to put our money in a bank that won't develop our communities, that won't give us a loan when we need it, then we yank that money out of that bank and we go somewhere else. And stop listening to Paula White and Joel Osteen and people who feed you a diet of evangelical poison when the Negro on the corner could use that money and that tithe to make something out of the lives of the people that you care for. Stop worshiping white people and stop worshiping those who hate you and embrace the people who look like you. Black skin, black nose, black hair, black behind, black eyes, black brains, black souls. That's what we need. I'm just saying what you said. Last, um, oh boy. last comment. One second, one second. Now, see, now hold up. See right there? No, hold up, no, I need everybody who's moving to stop. Because see, one of the biggest mistakes that we make in church is that we leave before the benediction <coughs> without understanding that of all the prayers at church, the benediction is actually the most important prayer because it's the one that's sending you forth after you finish at church. We've had a great conversation. We've had a great dialogue. Now you must deal with accountability. Right. For three years, I host the Reverend Sharpton's uh, Measuring the Movement. And the whole point of that was about people make commitments. They said, we're going to do this, this, this. And then we would hold them accountable over the course of the year to see who did what, who, who lived up to what they said, and those who mm. didn't. Mm. Because it's the one word we're most afraid of is accountability. There are people in here who are members of fraternities and sororities. We mentioned the black church, but actually, the one institution that does not depend on money from anybody else are black fraternities and sororities. They fund themselves. That's two million plus members. The thing that we have to get to deal with is accountability. And so to understand that, I know some of y'all are sitting here saying, okay, we appreciate the Stewart brothers, thank you so very much, this is great, this is wonderful, but we in Indianapolis and I hear all that, we can't change it. I'm only going to do this because I need you to physically see 
what I'm talking about. So literally the first four rows here could stand up. Just first four rows here. I need, to, I need you to actually see this to understand this. You prob you've got about, you've got more people who are standing up than the number of black people who were sitting in a church basement in Montgomery in 1955. Well, Susan mentioned Montgomery bus boycott. We always go, oh, 381 days. No, it was planned to be a one day boycott. Mm -hmm. sure. Then they said, let's go five. Right. Then it went 381. The beauty of this is that they elected Dr. King and he didn't even, he wasn't even in the room. He was actually the mimeograph machine. And they said, well, you gotta give a speech in an hour, so you gotta go get repaired. He went to the bathroom to write his notes out. The movement that transformed the world began December 1st, 1955. You could arguably say ended with his death on April 4th, 1968. It's 13 years. If you go through the history of this world, you can go to see MLK Street in India, in Serbia, when they were in Poland in the stockyards with Solidarity Movement in the 80s, Lech Walesa, they were singing Lift Every Voice and Sing. Eastern Europeans were singing We Shall Overcome. The Arab Spring had signs that said, I am a man, the same sign black men wore in Memphis, 1968. Right. The point I'm making is this. Jim Crow was brought to his knees because a handful of black people in a church basement in Montgomery decided to do a one-day boycott. That then transformed the world. You are sitting here saying, we're in Indianapolis, we can't change it. But literally, a handful of people in Montgomery, Alabama, started a movement that is still alive today around the world. But it requires the people in the room to actually care. Mm -hmm. It requires the people in the room to actually be committed. Right. It requires the people in this room, and we don't have to call anybody else who's not here, to actually launch a movement that could transform black America. You transform Indianapolis, you change Indiana. You change Indiana, you then impact Illinois, and Iowa, and Wisconsin. Then you impact the Midwest, and then it spreads. Mm -hmm. But all it requires is for a handful of people in this room who have the audacity to say we might be ordinary people who can do extraordinary things. This event is over, you got to get some marching, some marching instructions, some orders, but only you can decide what you are going to do from this point forward. And if you come back next year, you have a similar event, and you have a sa same kind of conversation, and then you say, well man, nothing happened in the last year, because it's your fault, mm. because you didn't do any of the work. Right. Take it away. I think we can all agree it's been a very robust conversation that we really needed to listen to more tonight. So I apologize we didn't get to audience questions, but I do, before you leave, want to bring up Marion County Clerk Myra Eldridge. Jesus. Good evening, everyone. I have the privilege of serving as the first African-American clerk of Marion County. Yeah. Appreciate your applause, but it's not good enough. We need to do better. We need to get more involved in democracy, and more of us need to run for office. I'm tired of reporters contacting me asking me why aren't minorities participating in the democracy that serves them in Marion County. Our voting numbers are dismal and we've got to do better, black America. This is the first time in the history of Marion County that we will have six early voting locations. of you know change happens at the ballot box we all with everything that's going on should not be walking we should be running to the ballot box if you notice I'm wearing a button and it says no excuses vote and as I take my seat black America in Marion County no excuses Let's vote and let's vote early. Thank you for taking my comment.
Marion County Clerk Myra Eldridge. Before we go, let's give a round of applause and really show our appreciation for the discussion from our panelists tonight. Our moderator, Roland Martin. Panelists, Dr. Michael Dyson, Susan Taylor, and Reverend Al Sharpton. Thank you for your participation tonight. And for those of you in the audience, please make sure if you've enjoyed what you've seen here this evening and experienced, fill out those evaluation forms in your program. Leave them in the boxes in the lobby as you leave. Also, if you took a picture with our panelists this evening, you'll be able to pick that up in the lobby at the box. And we look forward to seeing you at the next Stewart Speaker Series event with advocate, feature attorney, and political strategist, Angela Rye. Good night, and thank you for being here with us tonight.